Praise the Lord and welcome everyone to this session, Etiquette for Young Ministers. I'm so excited that you're here with me today. I'm excited to share with you some invaluable truths, some practical application to you becoming the best minister that God has called you to be. This is going to be a great time together. I have a lot to share with you. I'm Aaron Batchelor, Senior Pastor of New Life St. Louis, and I'm excited today because of what God is doing in your life. So we're going to take a little bit of time today, and we're going to talk through some things. Now, there's a lot more material than I can cover in the short amount of time that I have with you. And if you'll hold on to the very end of this session, I want to recommend some books to you that impacted my life greatly as a young minister and even to this day. And I'll share that with you in just a little bit. I started out in ministry whenever I was 11 years old with the call of God on my life, preaching my first message when I was 11, first revival when I was 13, licensed with the United Pentecostal Church at the age of 17, and ever since then, trying and aspiring to become the man that God wants me to be, to be used in the ministry. And so the things that I have learned were passed on to me from men and women of God that were much wiser and uh, had such great experience and a love for the Lord and a love for his kingdom. And I want to share those things with you today. They uh, have been tested. They're tried and true. And I believe they're going to work for you. It's going to be a good day. And we're going to get right into it in just a moment. But I want us to take a moment right now and I want us to pray. Let's first of all start with prayer. Let's ask the Spirit of God to speak to us today and to take these biblical truths and concepts and practical wisdom that have been passed on to us to melt into our hearts and minds and cause us to be the men and women of God that He's called us to be. So let's pray together right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you're with us in this session. I thank you for those that have joined us, O oh Lord, that are watching right now. You know who they are. You know where they have come from. You know their pedigree and personality and position. But, O oh Lord, your truth remains the same for all of us. I pray that you would anoint my mind, anoint my words, anoint their ears and their hearts to receive and understand. God, I thank you that you are raising up sons and daughters to prophesy in these last days. I thank you for these servants of the Most High God. I pray a blessing upon them right now. Bless our time together that we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's dive in because we've got some great things to talk about. As I mentioned to you, uh, I've been able and uh, privileged to be a part of ministry for a long time, and I'm very thankful for what the Lord has done in my life. And one of the scriptures that highlights the importance of what we're talking about today is Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Paul writes, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. That's kind of how I feel today. I don't feel like I have attained everything that God wants or has for my life yet, but I am pressing on because this is what Paul also wrote. He said, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the, listen now, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this call of God to serve in ministry in his kingdom is a high and a holy calling. Do you know why? Because of him who has called us, he is high and he is holy. And this calling that he has given to you and I is one of great importance and significance. And we cannot miss this moment today. That's why the things that I'm going to briefly share with you and that we're going to talk about just for the next few minutes are so important for us to learn, for us to understand, grasp a hold of, and to press like an athlete who is running for the highest award, highest medal, highest accolade. We are pressing into the kingdom of God. All right, so let's get into it. I've got many things to share with you, but we'll see what time will allow. Here's the first one. Let's just dive in to what may be the most difficult, challenging, practical aspect when it comes to etiquette for young ministers. Let's just go ahead and dive into the number one. At least for me, it was a challenge, and that is this, being patient. 
when it comes to serving in the kingdom of God, when it comes to ministry, and you get that sense of a call of God, that desire, whether you see a sister or a brother or hear someone preaching, uh, see a missionary, see a pastor, a youth pastor, somebody who has inspired you, or maybe in your time alone with God and his word, you feel the presence of the Lord calling you up higher. There is an urgency. There is a passion. There is a desire. And that has to be tempered with a fruit of the spirit it called patience. What I want to challenge you to do is learn to labor underground like a seed that has died to itself, planted beneath the earth, but is being watered. It is producing even while it's unseen. It is producing some things that is going to bring forth a fruit later on. What I want to tell you, young men, young ladies, is this. Don't be in a hurry to manifest. Don't be in a hurry to manifest. There will be time. There will be a place when things will come to fruition in your life that are going to exceed your imaginations. God is going to do it in your life, but don't be hurry to manifest. And when I'm talking about patience, here's what I really mean. Patience is not just the ability to wait. It's not just the ability to wait. It is the ability to keep a good spirit while waiting. Keep a good attitude while you're waiting. There's a lot of us, whenever we're younger and we're trying to attempt to be something for God, that will say, yeah, we'll wait, but we grumble while we wait. We complain while we wait. We're impatient and our spirits aren't right and our attitudes aren't right. But bless God, we're waiting. Well, patience isn't just about waiting. It is about having the right spirit and it's about having the right attitude. I remember whenever I was in my last year of Bible college and I was seeking after the Lord of where he wanted me to go and what he wanted me to do. And I was looking around me at all of my friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, who seemingly had opportunities afforded to them that I did not have. You know, pridefully, I thought myself to be something. I had already been preaching for a long time. I had traveled on missions trips. I had rubbed shoulders with some of the biggest names in Pentecost. And I thought of myself as somebody. And I just felt like the Lord had something great for my life, which he did. But it didn't seem to be manifesting. And I had friends that would come to me and say, hey, Aaron, where are you going? What are you doing? What, what opportunity do you have open to you? And I didn't have anything. And I remember going to the prayer room. I'd fast. I'd pray, pour my heart out before God, seemingly surrender everything that I had. But I was waiting to hear, God, where do you want me to go? And it was during a prayer meeting one time that I heard the voice of the Lord speak to me and say, Aaron, I want you to go back home. Home for me was a little town called Dupo, Illinois, where I was born and raised, where my father and my mother pastored for 40 plus years and had impacted so many lives. That's where I was birthed. That's where I was raised in ministry. And while it impacted me, while it was wonderful, I thought maybe there was something bigger. I thought maybe there was a bigger platform, a bigger church, something different that God would have for me. But I heard the Lord unmistakably say, Aaron, I want you to go home. I was a little frustrated by that, but I went to my pastor, who also happened to be my dad. And I went home, drove all the way, 30 minutes home. And I said, Dad, um, you know, here's what I'm feeling. What are you thinking? What do you think about this? And he said, Aaron, I really do feel the Lord wants you to come back home, serve with me, and be here at, at uh, our church here in Dupo. Well, I left that conversation and I was more frustrated, more aggravated uh, by what I had heard. Loved my dad, loved the church, but I just was eager. I was young and eager and desiring something more because God himself had given me a vision of something big and grand. And here I felt like he was putting me into a box that I didn't want to be in. Well, I'm on the road. I'm crying. I'm frustrated. Embarrassingly, I'm slamming my fist on the steering wheel and I I can't hear, I can't even see the road. So I pull over to the side so I don't create an accident, but I'm just frustrated. I pour out all my complaints before God. And when I'd finally finished, it felt as if Jesus himself moved into that car and sat down in the passenger seat beside me. And he gave me two verses. I wasn't quite familiar with them at the time. I think I knew one of them, but the second one, I wasn't quite sure. And so I had to go look them up. 
But here were the scriptures that he gave to me, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. He gave me that famous verse. But then the second one, Psalm 127 in verse one was this, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. You know what the Lord was teaching me in that moment that I'm sharing with you in this first point? And that is to be patient. Wait on the Lord and those things will come to pass. All right, the second thing that I want to share with you today really kind of ties into the very first thing of being patient. And that is this. I just learned to let God open the doors for you. It's called, in other words, humble promotion. Humble promotion. Let God open the doors. You're not going to have to campaign for a position. You don't need to get your buttons out at general conference or at a district conference or at youth congress and start passing out your business cards to everybody. And there's a place for networking and, and getting to know other ministers and pastors and people of God. That's all fine and wonderful, but check your motives. Make sure that you're not just counting on men to promote you, but that your promotion is going to come from God. Here's what Proverbs says in Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a person's heart. Isn't that true? But it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Let God open the door for you because if God opens up the door for you, no man can shut it. But if it's only a man that opens the door, man can certainly shut the door. Trust God to promote you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The most wonderful used men and women of God in the kingdom, in my experience and in my life that I have watched, are people of humility that have let God lead their lives, that have let God open up the doors. Peter wrote this. He said, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may exalt you in due time. Here's what I want to tell you, young people today, and that is this. Your place is already prepared. It's already prepared. God already has your destiny. He already has your future. He has every part of your life already in his hands. Your place is already prepared. Do you remember the story about the mother and her two sons who came to Jesus? Two of his young disciples, James and John. And they said, oh, Jesus. And their mother was there to support this cause. And she requested and said, Jesus, please let my sons sit on your right hand and on your left hand. And all the other disciples were aggravated at that. They were probably aggravated because they didn't think of it first or because they weren't bold enough to ask Jesus. But Jesus had to calm them down. He had to give them some perspective because because he said, are you able to drink of the cup that I'm going to be drinking of? In other words, speaking of, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to suffer the way that I'm going to have to suffer, the way that I'm going to have to pay the price? And they said, yes, Lord, we're willing to do that. And he said, you know, you're right. You are going to pay a price for this calling and to follow after me. But then listen to what Jesus said to them. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Did you catch it? prepared. God already has your place prepared. Stop fretting. Stop worrying. Stop stressing about it. Trust God. Let him promote you. He's already got your position. He already has your place prepared. Go ahead and just dig into the word, into prayer, into serving, and let God promote you. All right, here we are. We're moving. We got, we, I got to go quickly. Here's number three. Number three. You ready for this? Pay attention. Pay attention. That's the third lesson that the Lord taught me and that I'm learning, and that is pay attention. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. There was an elderly man of God who's since gone on to join that great cloud of witnesses by the name of J.T. Pugh. Every time I saw Elder Pugh on a platform or in a congregation, you know what he was doing? He had his notebook out. This was a long time before the iPads and iPhones and all the things we have to take notes this time, but he had that yellow pad out and he'd be writing down as preachers were preaching, taking notes. And I would think to myself, this man of God already knows so much. He already has so much invested in him. I can't, it's just blowing my mind that he's taking notes. He was a student of the word. He was a learner. He wanted to grow. He paid attention. I remember sitting in a very small group with at that time, my pastor, and then there was the Spanish pastor of the work, and then there was Brother J.T. Pugh and myself. Just those three elders 
and myself. I was the youngest. I was listening and I was just amazed at what was going on and being said. And I was very quiet at the time. And all of a sudden, Brother J.T. Pugh, he spoke up and kind of caught me off guard. He said, Brother Bachelor, what do you think about what we've been talking about? I, I kind of felt like Porky the Pig. I don't know if anybody knows about anything like that, but that's kind of how I felt. I just, I didn't know what to say. I was like, oh my Lord. You know what that, you know what that taught me of that moment was that Brother Pew wasn't just interested in talking. He was interested in listening. He was interested in learning and he wanted to hear what this little young minister had to say. That taught me that I also need to pay attention. Now, let me share with you. Oh man, this is a pet peeve of mine, but I, this is so important to me. Young ministers, oh, please listen to this. This is so important right here. Uh, Proverbs 18 and verse two says, fools find no pleasure in understanding, but they delight in airing their own opinions. They delight in airing their own opinions. <laughs> pay attention. It's better for us to listen. We've got one mouth, but we have two ears. So God wants us to listen more than we speak. Proverbs 17, 28 has been a lifesaver for me. It's been a lifesaver. You ready for it? Here it is. Even a fool, when he holds his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Listen, if you're not so wise right now and you think you're a little foolish, just keep your mouth shut. If you'll do that, the Bible says even a fool, when they're listening, when they're quiet, is counted wise. That's helped me and saved me in so many situations. So what does that look in practice? Whenever you're in a, in a service or in, a, in the congregation of people or one-on-one -on -one with someone, maybe at a conference somewhere, here's a pet peeve of mine. A pet peeve of mine is I've been with people that have stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with me and we've been talking but their eyes never met my gaze. They're always looking over my shoulder. They're always looking for the next person to talk to. They're always looking for somebody else to get their attention, somebody else more important, somebody else. And I felt so insignificant and it frustrated me. And I made a point that whenever I talk to someone, I'm gonna make eye contact with them. I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna pay attention because they're value to me, uh, valuable to me. There was another elder in my life and I got hurt. We're almost done. I, I, there was an elder in my life. I was at a general conference one, one time, many, many, many years ago. And I was young and, uh, and I was looking at him and I was just enthralled by his ministry and his life. And I stepped up to him and I said, Elder, it's so good to see you. Are you enjoying yourself at this conference? That's what I said. Are you enjoying yourself at this conference? He paused and said something to me I'll never forget. He said, no, I'm not enjoying myself. He said, in this moment, I'm enjoying you. I'm enjoying your presence and your company. That meant the world to me. This elder, this man with all of his background and experience, what he was telling me in that moment was he had my attention and that I had his and that we were together in this and that I was important. So pay attention. All right, I've just got a few minutes and then we got to conclude this thing. Are you ready? We're going to go quick here. Number four, learn to live. Write it down, learn to live. Here it is, because learning to live, I have found is more important than learning to preach. Learning to live is more important than learning to preach. You know why? One of my favorite quotes, I don't remember who said it, but I remember in Bible college, I picked it up. I love this quote. This quote is this, that preaching is not the performance of the hour. It is the overflow of a life. Your ministry will not just be what you prepared in the moment. Eventually, how you live will be spoken louder than what you say. You are an epistle read of all men. You're a letter. You're a book that people are reading through your actions and through your lifestyle. So learn to live and you can also learn to preach. I found that most usually you preach what you practice more than you practice what you preach because it spills out of you. Uh, I've spent far too much time trying to learn how to preach and not learning how to live like Jesus. But I've made up in my mind, and it's got to start now, that I'm going to learn to live like Jesus. Paul wrote it in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example all right, Paul, how are we going to set an example? Learn how to, he said, no, for the believers, set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Learn how to live. That is more important 
than learning how to preach. Learn how to live and be like Jesus because how you live will eventually spill over into how you minister, how you serve other people. So learn to be like Jesus. I have a fifth and final thing and then I got to share these books with you and we got to wrap this all up. Here's the fifth and final thing and that is submission to authority. Submission, that's the currency of the kingdom of God. You and I, we won't get anywhere without submitting to to God's authority. Hebrews 13, seven is a hard word for the world to accept. But for those of us that call ourselves and count ourselves ministers of the most high God, we cannot afford to disobey this because the Bible says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. There have been many, uh, that I've been able to influence uh, in my life that have submitted themselves to spiritual authority. And then there's those who have not, those who have walked away and now they have brought injury to themselves. I am encouraging us today to submit to authority. I know it's not easy, but listen to what Jesus did. Also in Hebrews chapter five, it says, who in the days of his flesh, speaking of Jesus, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that's able to save him from death was heard and that he feared though he were a son though he had position though he was the very son of God yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered if we can submit ourselves to God through obedience then God can use us in ministry like we have never experienced before all right, I got to close. This is it. I'm done. I hope I've shared some things that will help you, but I got to share with you some books that really impacted me. There's a lot of them, but I'm just going to share real quickly with these so uh, you can look at these later. These really helped me as a young minister, and I hope they help you. Here we go. The View from the Back of the Pulpit, J. Mark Jordan. Brother Jordan has a wonderful book right here. Help me as a young minister. Answer some questions that I have. You're going to want to get that one. This one, A Tale of Three Kings, a classic by uh, Edwards here, Gene. Edwards. This one talks about submission to authority. This one talks about overcoming any kind of bitterness and letting the Lord lead you. This is awesome. A Tale of Three Kings. Wonderful. Oh, a mentor, a wonderful man of God. Loved his ministry. Brother Billy Cole. Teachings by Billy Cole. Get this book. It's powerful. It will help you. All right. Why Revival Terries by Leonard Ravenhill will rip you to shreds. Just go ahead and bring a hanky. Pour your heart out before God. Uh, it is convicting. It's a powerful old classic book. Why Revival Terries by Leonard Ravenhill. This one right here, every young minister needs in their bookshelf right here. Celebration of Discipline. It's by Richard Foster. It's just the essential dip disciplines that will help you and I uh, minister effectively in the kingdom of God for every Christian, every believer. But this one's a classic. It'll help you. Oh man, get ready to dive deep. This took me a while to get through because it was so rich and so deep. J.T. Pugh, The Wisdom and the Power of the Cross. This was a powerful, moving book to me. You'll want to get it. And uh, here we go. Very practical, very helpful, but The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This is just great practical advice. And although he doesn't, um, as I remember, mention a lot of scriptures in there, there are biblical principles that you will find. And so I want to encourage you uh, that if you uh, will read some of these books, it'll help encourage you. It'll help grow you. But never forget, this one trumps it all. And this is the word of God. Your life will be founded on it and he'll order your steps and great things will happen. Thank you for joining this session. Glad that you were with us. God bless you in Jesus name.